Chapter 11 Iranian Magic Destruction of an enemy is wrought by a wax image, seven times melted and congealed. In olden times they believed that its power pursued even beyond the grave. Persia, Kitabi Azrari Siri Kavi, 1526 A.H. A waxen effigy of a person placed beside a corpse caused evil to befall the cursed person. Assyria, Marklu, Tablet 4. Persia should be the best of all fields for the study of Middle Eastern magic. But the conquests and religious controversies which have affected this buffer country between East and West during the past 3,000 years have resulted in much that would have been of great importance being lost. That the Zoroastrians had a body of magical ritual of great antiquity is well known. Zoroaster himself is the reputed author of 20,000 magical couplets. Some of this is preserved in the secret books of their descendants, the Parsis of contemporary India. The Arab conquest at the beginning of the 7th century swept away many traces of occult practices and substituted beliefs brought from the Arabian desert. Traces of the Assyrian and Babylonian supernatural beliefs, once so rampant in Persia, remain, generally speaking, only in rural areas, preserved in the form of tribal charms and spells. Works of contemporary magic are of comparatively rare occurrence in Persia, even today. Rare, that is, in comparison with such places as Egypt and India, where they are to be bought freely. When, however, one does come across a Persian magical manuscript, it very often bears unmistakable marks of serious occult study and belief, in contradistinction to the Indian and Egyptian efforts, which are, most often, merely intriguingly titled tracts to lure pennies from the credulous. On the other hand, the Persians usually take their magic seriously. Evidence of this is contained in a manuscript which I was allowed to examine by a self-styled adept. Containing some 400 pages, I concluded from its calligraphy and phraseology that it was about 200 years old. Entitled The Ocean of Mysteries, it contained no illustrations and, unlike many magical scripts, bore marks of a certain amount of research. The Ocean of Mysteries is arranged under 30 headings seems to have been adapted from some other work of a similar nature, and the copy under consideration had been annotated by some previous owner. Probably to avoid censure by Muslim religious teachers, the preface contains a warning that nothing can be done in the way of magic without the consent of God, and that consent is only extended to those who fit themselves for virtue by considerable effort of will and body. The first chapter is designed, apparently, to get the student into a suitable frame of mind for magic. Supernatural practices are referred to as means whereby those with special training may make one lifetime do the work of two, an unusual example of time-saving which goes to show, among other things, that the Easterner is not so patient as he may be thought. No person can become successful in his dealings with the spirits which guard magical secrets, says the ocean, until he has spent thirty days in meditation, eating as little as he can while still maintaining life. As far as possible, the gaze must be directed towards the ground, and failure to observe five ritual washings of the hands, feet, face, eyes and ears will be punished by complete lack of success as a magician. For the first thirty days' dedication, the invocant must spend some time alone and in a room which women are not allowed to enter, in memorizing the names of the angels which guard magical secrets. During this time, too, certain amulets must be prepared. The first is a hand holding a crescent moon, made in silver and wrapped in cotton and silk. The second, which should not be looked upon until thirty days have elapsed, must be made of clay and contain three pieces of coloured cotton, each the length of your small finger. The third amulet is two interlocked squares, inscribed on white paper with a black pen in black ink. 
These are the amulets which are supposed to guard the sorcerer from harm. They show a similarity to ancient Chaldean amulets, and the interlocked squares may be connected with the seal of Solomon. A patched cloak, or a cloak made up out of patchwork, must be prepared, in which the predominant colours are saffron, white and blue. Rose water is employed to give the cloak the requisite odour, and it is put on before any magical ceremony, with the words Rashan, Asha, Narash, which, as far as I am aware, are not used in any other important Eastern ritual. The writer of The Ocean tells us that it is essential that the head must be covered during all magical rites, though the feet must be bare. Do not grow your beard beyond the prescribed length. This latter injunction is probably connected with the Islamic teaching current in Persia, that the beard should not be longer than a clenched fist. If you wish, continues the sage, to hasten the illumination which will come to you, make sure that you wear this cloak when you meditate, and also see that you sit on a specially made rug of skins. The whole training takes a hundred days, thirty of abstinence, thirty of recuperation, and thirty of fasting from dawn to dusk, eating only at night. Then will follow the ten days in which you will feel that the power is coming into you. During the fasting, the magician must dedicate himself. This means he must decide what his aims are, and make certain exactly what he wants from his first magical experiment. It is important to note here that dogs, if allowed to come near the student during the hundred days, will so destroy his barakat, or power, that he will have to commence again after complete immersion and start at the new moon. Having thus clothed himself, fasted and dressed, the would-be sorcerer must then write, in black, on white paper, etc., what he wants to do in the way of spells. These are known as the kutub, or books, and he must look at them at least once a day, preferably morning and evening. After preparing himself thus, the magician goes to a spot where he will not be disturbed. This is the place of the first rite, the ritual which will make him a magician. Seven stones are set up, one above the other, on the ground. Around them he circumambulates, repeating the names of the angels to himself. Three things are to be carried by our hero, fresh clay mixed with grass, and two small pots, one containing honey, the other goat's wool. They are to be mixed together in the middle of the circle, and the following prayer is intoned after the eleventh circuit. Nulush, I do tie thee. I do command thee to come to me in the great name that was known to Solomon, the son of David, the great magician, in whose name I speak. Then the invocant, without looking for Nulush, repeats the formula of exorcism. Ashhadu in Allah ilaha ila Allah, repeated twice, and Audu belahi min ash shaitan a rajim. This latter formula is to prevent the devil interrupting the proceedings. The spirit which is invoked will come but will not appear in human form unless you command it to do so. Those, it is to be supposed, who may not be able to face the actual incarnate form of the spirit, can then order it to accomplish whatever is desired, and return home. But if the spirit is actually materialized, it can be told to come at certain times to take orders. It can even, reminiscent of the Arabian Nights, be induced to enter a bottle, and kept there by means of the following process. Take the tail of a cat and place it with several drops of indigo dye in a small metal bottle that shall not be made of anything but brass. If it is made of brass, dangers will be averted. Remove the cat's tail, but allow the indigo to remain in the bottle. As soon as you have repeated thirty-three times the words in the name of Solomon, son of David, prince of the magicians, I order the spirit of power, name the spirit, to enter into this bottle. He will appear and beg that you allow him to go home in peace. 
Say, Peace be upon you, and know, Spirit, that thy home is now in this bottle, and I am thy master, and all that I say or do shall be thy interest and aim to help. The Spirit will then enter the bottle in the form of a small white cloud. You must make sure that you have a stopper for this bottle, and this must fit tightly and be made of lead and of no other material. This stopper you will then put in the neck of the bottle, so that a space is left. Into this space you will pour boiling pitch mixed with the sap of the cedar tree. When you want to speak to the spirit, call him and treat him like a friend. You will then see him through the side of the bottle, and he will have a small face, like a human, but round. The spirit should be spoken to once a day, and must be allowed to work small favours, just like your slave, for this is the way to make a slave happy. He likes to know that he is of service to his master. When the spirit sees some harm coming to his master, he will call, and it will sound like a small shout in front of you, addressing you as Solomon, son of David. If you can, you must allow him to return home once in twelve years. He will always return to you if you take from him the small turquoise tablet, which has his names and functions thereon, and with which all the jinni were invested by Solomon, and without which they are not free. In order to memorize the entire contents of a book, the genie will be ordered to project it into the magician's mind, and the latter will learn it while asleep. There is a complete catalogue of spells, charms and other processes that can be accomplished. It seems that they can be done with the aid of any genie unless they contradict his nature. The nature of the genie means that some have been given dominion of fire, others that of air, and so on. As would be natural in a society where such activities were prevalent, other magicians might try to harm the sorcerer. This will be prevented by a spirit, which will call out when a spell is being woven against his master. He will also tell how this magic can be countered, by making a small clay or wax image and putting this in a boat in a small artificial pond, which boat is then sunk and certain imprecations recited over the wreck. In matters of the heart, observes the author, great discretion must be exercised, for there are some things which are possible and yet reprehensible, and the performance of these tasks will be repugnant to the honour of the spirit, and he might try to escape, rather than carry out instructions which are not allowed to him. Hidden treasures will be brought, we are told, even from the uttermost parts of the earth, but you will surely not desire them and you will see that there will be many other things that you will want to do by means of this genie which will contribute towards the well-being of mankind, and which will surprise even you, though you had before been a man of exemplary habits and desirous of doing good. The recreations of a Persian sorcerer, however, are delightful. To fly, call thrice the name of the spirit, saying, I desire to fly to Yemen, and you will be there in a few moments. If you do not secrete upon your person the bottle, you will not be able to return. It seems that magicians wanted to dwell in beautiful gardens, and the technique for being transported there is the subject of several long passages. There are Indian and Mongolian gardens, and those of the garden spirits unknown to the world at large, but existing for the pleasure of the few who find their way there. Storms can be raised, rich people beggared, poor travellers helped to oases, the ugly made beautiful and vice versa. All the dreams of life can be realised once you have a spirit in a bottle. Ordinary magicians, though, cannot maintain their magical powers indefinitely without recharging them. Hence the warning, the student should always make sure that he has repeated his rites once a year or the power will become weaker. If he sees that the spirit is not pleased, he must go away to a secluded place and repeat the magical words, wearing his robes and in the same way in which he did at first. And then he is to return to the spirit and ask, What ails thee? 
Another indispensable requirement is that of secrecy. Under no circumstances may it be revealed to anyone, whatever, that you are able to command the spirits. This is not only because such things are frowned upon, but because your power will be lost in this way, and you will not have another chance to develop it until twenty years have passed. Anyone embarking upon a period of magical training for the attainment of a petty or unworthy end will either become unworthy of the society of men, or will become purified. Do not expect that the exercise of magic will leave you unchanged. Your motives and your thoughts, unless brought under restraint, will deepen and will change. It is not a ritual for those who are weak in heart and courage. There is a pleasant, almost light-hearted air about this book which is out of keeping with the traditional Eastern writings on the subject. The whole ritual, if such it may be called, is simplified and fairly direct. Although there are grave warnings against certain attitudes and practices, they are nothing compared with later tracts and the religio-magical writings of the ancient Semites and Akkadians. Modern writers on occult subjects would call this a composite ritual, tracing in its characteristics of the Semites, of India and the Sumerians. Whether it is bogus or not naturally depends upon the standpoint of the critic. This much, however, may be said. It is very probably not an entirely original work, and does not represent a transmitted grimoire of sorcery dating from high antiquity. Annotations on the margins indicate that it may have been a text used by a group of independent magicians over a century ago. Although I have never seen, or heard of, another copy, these marginal notes query certain passages, and in one place, for example, the unknown commentator has written, Jasmine is better than goat hair. One curious chapter deals with arguments against alchemy and go so far as to state that it should never be attempted as it is a delusion, and even if not a delusion, is something which was originally intended to be something else, and which is displeasing to spirits and God alike. While the thesis that alchemical writings are allegorical and refer to the refining of the human soul is familiar to those versed in Arab philosophy, nevertheless it is unusual to find a magical book actually condemning the art. Persian magic, as it is known today, contains elements from the rites of the Mongols, Chinese, Hindus and Arabs, in addition to native beliefs and practices. One of the characteristics of a Persian sorcerer of old was his belief in the Huma bird, which never alighted on earth, but travelled far and wide and brought tidings to initiates of what was happening in every country. The Huma, it appears, does not speak any human tongue. Like Solomon, it is necessary to learn the speech of birds before his messages can be understood. It is stated that a model of one of these birds was found suspended over the throne of Tipu Sultan in 1799. The Huma flies on the winds and collects his information partly from the Deves, or spirits, who are to be found everywhere. The largest houses in Persia have towers which catch the wind and cool the rooms underneath in the summer heat. If the day be auspicious, the good deeves will make the winds blow unless they are needed by the Huma during one of his periodical transits across the heavens. Being such a traveller, and also of uncounted age, the Huma knows the sight of the fountain of life. Watched over by magicians, and guarded by innumerable jinns and divs, the fountain is believed by many to be situated in the Persian hills. There is no doubt that throughout the ages people have actually embarked on the search for the fountain. It is said of those who do not return that they have found it, and either been killed before getting even one precious drop, or that they have drunk it and been transformed into pure beings who do not wish to return to their homes. Mountains, in Persia as elsewhere, have many magical associations. The Kohi Gaba, the fire-worshipper's mountain, rises steeply to a considerable height. 
On the top there is a ruin, said to be all that is left of an ancient fire temple. Here the concentrated essence of magic lingers, and a host of specially endowed jinns dwell. The power, it is claimed, causes people who approach to recoil. There is something almost physical about it. Tales are told of those who have climbed the Ko and returned mad or lame or wasting away. It is possible that these legends are a survival of pre-Islamic times, when Zoroastrians probably circulated such rumours to enable themselves to practice their arts there unobserved. Not everyone, however, who approaches the dread ruin will suffer danger or destruction. Young brides consider it the ultimate token of love if their husbands climb the heights and bring back a stone from the ruins. Not far from this famous place are other hills equally endowed with magical beliefs. Here the fire-worshipping magicians used to place offerings of fruit to propitiate certain spirits and to lure them into captivity to do their bidding. Those who had a desire to fulfil used to have it written and placed in a bowl of fruit for the Magians to take to these heights. On the top of one of these hills grew the Tobo tree, the tree of eternal happiness. This is said to be like the one in paradise which grows at Allah's right hand. Great griefs and fears are carried by good fairies to this spot, where they are cleansed and the sufferers set free from unhappiness.